Record-breaking infections have pushed Malaysia's healthcare system to the brink of collapse. Hospitals are buckling under the crushing weight of COVID-19 patients. It's an understatement to say that the Malaysian healthcare system is currently under tremendous stress. It has been too many times in the past weeks that we have to choose who lives and who dies. In spite of the multiple lockdowns, COVID-19 cases continue to surge. Children don't go to school and you, know, you have bills that to pay. You know, all these things become real pressure and it's like a pressure cooker. It will explode one day. It will explode. Growing public unhappiness over the government's handling of the health crisis presented a fresh opportunity for UMNO to weaken the leadership of the embattled Prime Minister. UMNO cannot be part of the PN government because they have failed. If there's any integrity left, he should have resigned because he has not prepared to face Parliament and not confident of having majority. Finally, Muhyiddin Yassin bowed to mounting pressures and resigned from his post as Prime Minister. But will his political exit mark the end of the political crisis in Malaysia? On August 16, 2021, Muhyiddin Yassin announced his resignation as Malaysia's eighth Prime Minister. The decision was made three weeks before Parliament is set to convene to determine his legitimacy to govern amid mounting pressures from both the opposition and the biggest bloc within the ruling coalition, UMNO. But how did it finally come to this? The row upon row of burial plots at this Muslim cemetery here in Bukit Kiara, Kuala Lumpur, offers a stark reminder of the devastation caused by COVID-19. Part of the nation's soul is dying every day as it battles to stop the raging pandemic. The virus has infected more than 1.4 million people in the country and at least 13,000 people have died from the disease. For months now, 30-year-old Muhammad Rafiuddin Zainal Rashid has been struggling to come to terms with this sad reality. The undertaker and his team of 20 volunteers have been working round the clock just to keep up with the avalanche of requests from family members whose loved ones died of COVID-19. Before the pandemic began, he used to handle around four to seven burials a day. Today, he has to arrange for up to 30 funerals a day, stretching the team to unprecedented limits. Hari yang paling sibuk ialah bila berlaku uh, kematian yang banyak masa ada satu hari itu, bilangan kes 100 kes, lebih 100 kes. Dan bila berlaku kematian begitu, kami menerima jumlah pengurusan jenazah, permintaan pengurusan jenazah yang terlalu tinggi dan menyebabkan kami kekurangan van jenazah, kami kekurangan tim, ditambah lagi dengan masalah kubur, tanah kubur yang menetapkan had limit waktu pejabat saja. Lepas pukul 5 petang, tidak ada operasi lagi. Jadi terpaksa tunggu jenazah hari esok, maka itu menambahkan kegalutan. The father of four himself is a COVID-19 survivor. So are his wife and his youngest child. Fortunately for him and his family, the conditions were not serious. All of them have recovered from the disease. Still, Mr. Rafiuddin feels very disturbed by the endless wave of bodies being brought to the burial sites every single day. Kalau kita tengok pada kes harian yang sekarang ni, dia memang semakin menaik memang meninggi dan tidak ada menunjukkan seolah-olah akan turun. Jadi dah lebih dah hampir setahun kita buat persyaratan darurat ni. Saya melihat tidak ada perkembangan yang positif. 
Macam kami ni di bawah bahagian pengurusan jenazah sendiri pun merasai kesusahan tu dengan penambahan kes yang setiap hari semakin banyak kematian. Malaysia today has the highest number of confirmed COVID-19 infections per million people in Southeast Asia. Daily cases breached the 20,000 mark for the first time on August 5, 2021. And these infections have not come down drastically ever since. Hospitals were struggling to cope with the surge in infections. It came to a point when doctors were forced to make the difficult choices of prioritizing intensive care beds for patients who have higher chances of recovery compared to those with poorer prognosis. Most wards are full and there's literally no space to create new COVID wards. It's like a factory, we have to move on because the numbers keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. More tragically, it's the amount of patients we have to watch die because we don't have the resources, equipment or manpower to deal with these patients. It has been too many times in the past, past weeks that we have to choose who lives and who dies. We have only one ventilator and we have three patients gasping for air. Who gets the ventilator and a shot at living? It's a call that we have to make almost every day. Malaysia broke its record for the highest number of daily reported COVID-19 deaths at 360 cases on August 8, 2021. Six hospitals across the country had to resort to using special containers to store large number of bodies of COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 patients. It's an understatement to say that the Malaysian healthcare system is currently under tremendous stress. We have problems of running out of bed space, lack of adequate staff to be able to provide the kind of care and support for people who are there needing uh, treatment. We see uh, ICU wards being filled to capacity, wards that are now being converted into uh, intensive care. Uh, we are seeing uh, ventilators uh, running out. Hospitals are having to say that we, they can no longer take in patients. Uh, people are desperately in need of oxygen. And in some locations, as we've started to see in some hospitals, having to share uh, oxygen lines, something that we only saw in India, we are seeing now here in the Klang Valley. In July, horrifying pictures and videos of overwhelmed hospitals in Klang Valley went viral. Several hospitals even converted their parking lots into emergency units to accommodate more patients, stretching exhausted medical workers to the limit. To accommodate all the extra patients, most emergency departments in Klang Valley, in Surambani and Malacca have expanded, sometimes needing to use even the parking lots of the hospital to cater to these patients. Uh, in the hospital I work in, we have created six to seven new isolation zones just to cope with the numbers of COVID patients. And still there is not enough. Patients are still being sat on the floor, patients are still on wheelchairs, and patients are still in camp beds. Speaking to CNA on the condition of anonymity because of a gag order, the doctor said never in a million years did he imagine he would have to go through such a horrific situation in his career and it started to take a toll on him. We have been battling the COVID pandemic for more than a year. We've no end in sight. Uh, and it looks like things are getting worse. My colleagues and I, our mental health uh, is not, it's not strong anymore. Besides the constant fear of catching the virus or bringing it back to our family, to our friends, there is also this perpetual stressor that every time you come to work, something may happen. Uh, your PPE may, may, there might be a leak in your PPE. You might catch the virus. On January 12th, Malaysia's King, Sultan Abdullah Ahmad Shah, proclaimed a state of emergency across Malaysia on the advice of Malaysian Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin and it was scheduled to last until August 1st this year. 
the move was intended to give the government additional powers to direct the use of private hospital resources to treat COVID-19 patients and help rein in the third wave of COVID-19 infections. Parliament and state legislative assemblies were also not allowed to sit during the emergency period. It's not an emergency per se, you don't see uh, army on the street, but it's basically to facilitate whatever required for us to improve our way of handling COVID-19 without having to go through specific debates, say, in Parliament. Uh, the idea is for us to act very quickly uh, as a government of the day that is responsible to fight COVID-19 with a view to achieve balance in lives and livelihood. Yeah? So I think what we have done so far, uh, if you look at the ordinance that we have uh, invoked uh, and put to practice, has helped out greatly, for example, to uh, acquire uh, non-governmental assets, non-government resources under the ACTA and tighten up in certain areas where people can misuse the freedom of speech, for example, yeah, uh, to create a panic. But in spite of the imposition of the emergency rule, the number of infections kept rising and the healthcare system was said to be very close to its breaking point. Four months into the state of emergency, the number of infections were at an all-time high, recording close to 8,000 cases daily. The whole idea of the emergency uh, uh, being uh, uh, implemented by uh, Muhyiddin was basically to suspend parliament. I think, I think uh, uh, most people have already come to that conclusion. It's got nothing to do with, uh, with uh, managing COVID because, you know, uh, we are laughing stock because we have a national emergency, but then COVID numbers keep rising and keep beating, beating records every, uh, every week, you know, in terms of uh, uh, infections and deaths. On June 1st, the government was forced to impose a total lockdown throughout the country in a desperate attempt to stem the tide of infections. But even that effort failed to bring down the numbers. What actually went wrong? If we look at the data, uh, there were segments of the economy that was allowed to open. And this, I think, in part, allowed the virus to uh, continue to spread within certain parts of the population. Second, if we look at historical data itself, we do know that uh, the virus has already spread into the community. So it's already there within the Malaysian communities. So a lot of people who were infected have continued to infect others. And despite the lockdowns that was put in place, it failed to bring down the numbers and it continued to expand. In addition to that, we also have uh, people who um, circumvented the rules and took the trouble to make trips out of town to visit family members during the Hari Raya festivities. This again, uh, allowed the virus to spread beyond the central region of the country and to other parts. Of Malaysia. Over time, the trust and confidence among Malaysians in the government's ability to handle the crisis began to wane. With the number of infections soaring, Mr. Muhyiddin's approval rating continued to plunge. He was banking on high vaccination rates to help cool the growing public anger over the government's handling of the crisis. Apparently, that wasn't enough to save his political career. COVID-19 pandemic has hit Malaysia hard. More than 13,000 people have died from the disease so far. Just two weeks after the Hari Raya celebrations in May this year, Muhammad Tajuddin Muhammad Razdi lost two of his family members to COVID-19. They died within days of each other. On May 28, 2021, his uncle-in-law died, followed by his mother-in-law just three days later. Eight other family members were also infected, but they soon recovered According to Tajuddin, 
His 84-year-old mother-in-law, Siti Salma, felt sad about leaving her home in Taman Besa Mohiba in Kajang Selangor to live with one of her other daughters about 13 kilometers away from her house. So when she suddenly became very withdrawn and stopped eating after Hari Raya, Tajuddin and his family didn't think anything was amiss. Quite normal, you know, sometimes, as I said, depression and all that, so we didn't think much of it. And suddenly, about on the third day, uh, she got weaker, and uh, my wife said that maybe we should take her for the swap. Uh, before that, nobody, nobody uh, thought about doing that, and uh, brother-in-law came, and other, other uh, children also came to look at her and, you know, feed her and all that. And uh, that night, uh, only my, my sister took her, even though she was very weak already, uh, for a swap. So this is the next day, I... Tajuddin and his wife got a call from the hospital. He was informed that his mother-in-law had passed away. Tajuddin's wife in particular was deeply affected by the sudden loss of her beloved mother. She couldn't come to terms with the fact that she wasn't able to stay by her side and care for her during her final moments. I had warned her not to go because we cannot violate whatever the government says OP was pretty good. So that was, I think, one of the terrible things for her to not being able to feed her and then not being able to see her dead body. She wanted to go and said no. You know, she just want to work to see from the car. I said, no, you see from the car, people will see you, then you want to go out and have all this interaction. And it's going to be a problem. So I, I strictly said, no. I mean, I had to put my foot down, okay, and said, no, you should not. Mr. Tajuddin blames the government for his family's predicament. He feels that the government was not decisive enough in implementing the lockdown measures from the very beginning. Everybody knows that the state of emergency has nothing to do with COVID in Malaysia. The state of emergency is simply to put the government uh, in power because they've lost the, the, the majority. We, we know that it's an open secret and that is the sad part about it, very sad. I think the government did the MCO2, uh, 2.0 they call it, to be a mistake because they said that in order to take care of the economy, then they let this, uh, the uh, religious celebrations and all that, even though they say it's controlled the Ramadan Bazaar. If we uh, impose total lockdown as we did uh, in, uh, in, we call it PKP1, if we impose it now, I think the damage to the economy to balance livelihood will be more severe. Uh, if you notice that we are following the global trend, when first phase one lockdown, you notice that the entire world like kind of shut down. Therefore, we suffered. And then on June 16, 2021, against the backdrop of rising number of COVID infections, the Malaysian king, Sultan Abdullah, called for the parliament to reconvene. It was to allow for the emergency ordinances and the national recovery plan to be debated in parliament by members of the house. But Mr. Muhyiddin remained reluctant to abide by the royal advice. He wanted Parliament to sit again in September instead. That's when the country would move into phase three of its COVID-19 exit plan. On June 29th, the King again ramped up pressure on Mr. Muhyiddin to reconvene Parliament. Mr. Muhyiddin finally caved into pressure from the King and instructed the House Speaker to call for a special parliamentary sitting. He, however, defied the King's decree for a full debate on the coronavirus emergency. So after much uh, pressure, uh, the government finally uh, conceded and uh, uh, have this parliament sitting. But nevertheless, we know that uh, uh, this parliament sitting is without uh, any motions, without any forms of uh, uh, real debate and any, any, any voting uh, for simple and uh, for clear political reason. There isn't any debate for voting and so forth because it's, we are finishing the emergency 1st of August. What we should call for debate? Are you saying that you're going to outlaw the emergency? Which has already been proclaimed by the king? 
So I don't think we're going to waste time in trying to debate. Uh, we just want to reaffirm uh, and, and uh, reaffirm it is a law proclaimed by the king. So there isn't any need for a debate. But on the first day of the special parliamentary sitting on July 27, 2021, then de facto law minister Taki Yudin Hassan dropped a bombshell. He made a shock announcement that the six emergency ordinances meant to fight COVID-19 had already been revoked the week before. The announcement had thrown the nation into a state of confusion as the decision was made without royal consent. But we all know that to revoke emergency ordinances, it must be consented by the king. But this, is not, this has not been done. And uh, today, uh, our MPs have keep uh, harping on that, uh, keep questioning that, but the answers was not forthcoming. So that means that uh, the government of the day is not uh, following procedures and is not doing things according to the law. The whole idea was to avoid a debate as much as possible because the problem with a debate is that all sorts of other stuff can be brought in to embarrass the government. So that's the reason why they wanted this to go away quickly. The decision earned a rare public rebuke from the king. He expressed his deep disappointment over the fact that his royal assent was not sought first before the emergency ordinances were revoked as agreed to in January. The king's rebuke sparked calls for Mr. Muhyiddin to resign. UMNO's president, Ahmad Zahid Hamidi, even described Mr. Muhyiddin's reaction as a clear act of treason. Others saw his action as a violation of the nation's constitution. Cabinet yang diketuai oleh Perdana Menteri Tan Sri Muhyiddin telah melanggar semangat perlembagaan, menghina institusi raja berperlembagaan, khususnya Deputuan Agong, dan ini termasuk juga Menteri di Jabatan Perdana Menteri, meng mengelirukan Dewan dan oleh demikian telah tidak bercakap benar kepada Dewan dan mengelirukan rakyat Malaysia. Kita tidak ada pilihan selain menuntut Perdana Menteri meletakkan jawatan. Betul, setuju. Letak jawatan hari ini juga. Majlis tertinggi UMNO. On August 3, 2021, the largest party in the Perikatan National Government, UMNO, announced that 11 MPs from the party had withdrawn their support for Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin and his government. They were led by party president Ahmad Zahid Hamidi. The announcement meant that Mr. Muhyiddin could only count on 104 MPs at most, short of 111 MPs needed to form a majority government. He lost the support of another four AMNO MPs shortly after. So, AMNO cannot be part of the PN government because they have failed. Now, uh, for Zahid as the president, you cannot uh, basically uh, say that it is his uh, wish that uh, drove, drove UMNO to, to pull out. It's actually the members who have already decided uh, in January this year, before the, em the emergency was imposed. Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin, however, resisted calls for him to resign. Instead, he planned to table a motion of confidence to determine the legitimacy of his position in Parliament next month. He was thinking in this one month period, uh, he would be able to cobble together a coalition that would be above the threshold of 110 or 111. Um, and I think when we look back in time, we can see some elements of that. But the effort proved futile. In the end, there are a total of 105 opposition MPs who had called for his resignation. Together with 15 AMNO MPs who had retracted their support for Mr. Muhyiddin, this adds up to 120 MPs who have now opposed him. That means Mr. Muhyiddin only had the support of 100 MPs for him to remain as the Prime Minister. Meanwhile, 
public frustration has spilled onto the streets. Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin's approval rating is also at an all-time low. It has fallen from 69% a year ago to 50% today. Uh, the pandemic is also increasingly uh, affecting public approval of the government's uh, handling because uh, a lot of people are suffering under the lockdowns. We also have media reports about signs of psychological distress, suicides, uh, alongside the typical stories about business closures and uh, job losses. So all in all, when we look at the picture as things currently stand right now, the public approval of the government's handling has been pretty negative. In the meantime, Malaysia's economy remains in dire straits as the government continues to grapple with the impact of the pandemic. More middle-income Malaysians have slipped into the poorest 40% of the population. Nearly 800,000 people are out of jobs. How much worse can it get? Forty-year-old Nur Azura Muhammad Hanib used to enjoy a steady income while working as a cook in a school in Selayang, Kuala Lumpur. But that changed after she lost her job late last year. That's when the country was in the thick of the COVID-19 pandemic. The health crisis led to the closures of many schools. Since then, she has tried various ways to earn an income to feed her family of four children, including running a small-scale business, selling nasi lemak at a stall near the market. Sebelum PKPD ni, saya meniaga kecil-kecilan dekat gerai uh, nak pergi ke pasar burung. Saya ada gerai kat situ. Okey, uh, sebabkan PKPD saya tak boleh ni sebab dia punya masa uh, pukul 8. So, pukul 8, 8 malam, eh, 8 pagi, 8 malam. So, saya ambil jalan lain, saya buat online. Uh, di samping tu juga, uh, selepas saya meniaga nasi lemak ni, online meniaga nasi lemak, saya buat uh, penghantaran barang dari rumah ke rumah. Uh, macam pelanggan order, saya menghantar. The single mother used to earn around 65 ringgit or about 15 US dollars a day as a school cook. Today, she could earn the same amount by selling nasi lemak near the market on a good day. But since additional restrictions were imposed on the area, her daily earnings have plunged to about 40 ringgit a day or less than 10 US dollars if she's lucky. Memang keadaan saya memang bertambah teruk lah dengan sebab saya sebagai ketua keluarga nak pergi keluar mencari rezeki untuk anak-anak saya kan. So orang kata masa saya tu banyak di luar dibandingkan masa dengan anak-anak. Nur Azura, however, is still fortunate. Despite losing her regular job, she could still rely on her cooking skills to earn some cash. The reality is, the pandemic has dealt a severe blow to the Malaysian economy. According to the latest official figures in June 2021, around 800,000 people have lost their jobs since the pandemic began and hopes for a quick economic recovery has now evaporated due to the latest wave of infections. The central bank has even lowered the country's GDP forecast. The economy is expected to expand between 3 and 4 percent this year from an earlier projected GDP growth of between 6 to 7.5 percent. Well, okay, in terms of uh, GDP, you know, the government has this high-end estimate of 6 to 7, which I think a lot of private sector economists uh, aren't even projecting. Um, if we look at where we are in terms of capacity being subpar, maybe we're towards 4% GDP growth. And really, if uh, they continue with the, you know, very leaky lockdown, unfortunately, although it's supposed to boost the economy, I think it's probably going to have the opposite effect and it could even go lower. To help cushion the impact of the lockdown, 
the previous government under Muhyiddin Yassin announced a 40 billion ringgit or about 9 billion US dollars stimulus package in May this year. In total, eight stimulus packages were rolled out worth 530 billion ringgit or 125 billion US dollars. And yet, all these fiscal measures could do little to alleviate the economic pain suffered by the people. We do notice that the government has announced aid packages, uh, stimulus packages, uh, but I think it takes time for all of these things to reach people. And second, the quantum involved is relatively limited. So only some people are able to benefit from this and, and even then a limited uh, amount. So it doesn't go perhaps far enough for many people that have lost you know, significant incomes and are struggling on the remainder of their savings. During the first month of the total lockdown in June, Malaysians flooded social media platforms with the hashtag Bandera Pute movement or the white flag movement. It called on families who are struggling to stay afloat during the lockdown to hang a white flag or cloth in front of their homes. That way, help could be extended to them in the form of food and other supplies to help ease their financial burden. White flag was basically a, a call out for help. And uh, the amazing thing is a lot of Malaysians uh, have responded. Uh, businesses have also tried to help uh, people, uh, you know, calling uh, for that aid. Because after a month of ineffective lockdown, it's just been a, a terrible thing going on. And um, in terms of social media, I think Malaysia has never seen such heavy political activism. Former minister in the Prime Minister Department, Mohamed Redzwa Mohamed Yusuf, acknowledged that many Malaysians are feeling the pinch. But he feels that Mr Muhyiddin had done the best he could under the circumstances. In terms of the number of packages that we have sent down to the people, fiscal injection and so on, so far we have uh, we have uh, spent, or rather we are going to spend more than 500 billion a combination stimulus package and as well as uh, direct fiscal aids. So that's been gone to the ground. And I think for those people that, as you mentioned, raising the white flags, you know, there are people that has not reached or has not been reached to get those aids. And I can understand their position, but some people will capitalise that position or that situation and trying to uh, manipulate as such if we are not doing anything. So long as COVID-19 infection numbers remain high and the lockdowns are in place, any fiscal measures meant to help those in need will be seen to be ineffective in pulling the people out of their economic predicament. Mr Muhyiddin had been banking on the hope that every single adult will be vaccinated by October this year. That's also the period where the economy is expected to reopen once herd immunity is achieved. But some, like Azru, feels that slow vaccination efforts at the beginning had cost Malaysia dearly. I still remember at that point of time in which they were considering participation, statements made by senior uh, government officials and civil servants who were saying things like, we are not going to pay for something that we have not seen. We are not going to pay for something that has not been proven. And there was even a feeling amongst uh, the uh, senior health officials that perhaps a vaccine wasn't even necessary because Malaysia at that point of time was supposedly uh, reporting low numbers and even at one point, no cases of positive COVID-19 uh, and this is something that was the mindset at that point of time. However, later on in September onwards, this mind shift shifted and there was a rapid revelation or, or feeling that it was necessary to invest in a vaccine for the future based on what was available. So Malaysia started very late in the vaccination game. And soon, pressure began to mount on Mr Muhyiddin after 15 lawmakers from UMNO withdrew their support for him. Power was slipping out of his grip. 
His appeal to the opposition to back him up during the upcoming confidence vote in Parliament was flatly rejected. Mr. Muyudin had no choice but to tender his resignation less than two years after assuming power on March 1, 2020. But will his successor be any better? Will it help to put an end to the political crisis once and for all? It was less than two years ago when Muyidin Yassin defected with more than 30 other members from Bursatu out of Pakatan Harapan. Today, 17 months on, he appears to have gotten a dose of his own medicine. Being the largest party in the ruling coalition with 38 MPs, compared to Bursatu's 31, Amno was unwilling to play second fiddle to Bursatu. And that created a lot of friction between the Amno faction, led by its party president, Ahmad Zahid Hamidi, and Basatu. Amno is so used to dominating that it is very, very sensitive to any potential perception of it being dominated. Consequently, almost from day one, he's really had to turn his energy inwards and seek to maintain his parliamentary majority. And I think that this is kind of the thread that you see in the rest of his administration, pretty much, right? And certainly over the last nine to 10 months, it has been on either shoring up the majority or avoiding putting it to the test. And his position became even more unstable due to the raging pandemic. The prolonged lockdowns had caused severe disruptions to economic activities. The lack of financial support also heightened anger among many Malaysians, including Mr. Rafi Yudin. Bagi saya perasaan tu memang kecewa sangatlah mendalam sebab kita dijanjikan lockdown ataupun PKP dua minggu kemudian ditambah lagi dua minggu dengan pelbagai nama PKP, PKPP, PKPD, tapi kes tetap bertambah. Jadi untuk apa benda ni kita dikurung dan kita tengok situasi pun tidak berubah maka bagi saya uh, satu imej yang menunjukkan bahawa kerajaan hari ini memang gagal lah untuk menangani ini dan sekiranya mereka tak mampu sebaiknya undur diri secara hormat uh, sebelum mereka mungkin uh, undur secara yang mungkin memalukan mereka kan That view was also echoed by Mr Tajudin 10 of his family members contracted the disease, of which two of them died. He feels strongly that the government shouldn't be afraid to step down if it no longer has the support of the population. I think a lot of people are very tired of this Perikatan National Government. But if they can <laughs> change their ways, sure, we, we, we can give them a chance. Uh, I think the economy and then the, this, uh, this COVID thing is, is topmost in everybody's mind. And uh, people are saying that a, a fresh hand would be, would be better. Riding on the wave of public resentment, coupled with the king's displeasure over the government's handling of the crisis, Amno decided to pull the trigger. 15 of its MPs retracted support for Mr. Muhyiddin's government. The move was supported by senior members of AMNO, including party president Ahmad Zahid Hamidi and former Prime Minister Najib Razak. Zahid is currently on trial for a slew of corruption charges, while Najib was found guilty in the first of a series of one MDB-linked trials. AMNO's withdrawal of support greatly weakened Mr. Muhyiddin's hold on power causing him to lose his majority in Parliament. He then made a last-ditch effort to secure a bipartisan support from the opposition through a slew of reform proposals to help shore up his position ahead of the confidence vote. But the offer was swiftly rejected by the opposition. The Muhyiddin Yassin administration was formed under very unusual circumstances. 
And from day one, um, you know, he's faced the allegation that his administration is a backdoor government. And I think for a lot of people in the opposition, you know, it is rightly Pakatan Harapans. I think there was very much a feeling that he was not sincere, that these were sort of a last ditch effort. His failure to secure the backing from the opposition left him with no choice but to step down. He saw the writing on the wall and it was very, very clear to him that all the forces were lined up against him. Could he have stayed longer? The answer is probably yes, until the first sitting. But the moment the king intervened, everything was turned upside down because every other group who had been waiting quietly on the sidelines decided to pile on the attack by accusing her of being disloyal to the king. So the moment the king issued a statement, it was quite clear that it was politically impossible for him to carry on. The race to pick a new prime minister soon gained momentum following his resignation. Among the front runners for the top post is 61-year-old former deputy prime minister and UMNO vice president Ismail Sabri Yaqob. Neither UMNO president Ahmad Zahid Hamidi nor his deputy Muhammad Hassan were in the running. But in the end, the coveted post went to Mr Ismail Sabri. He secured the support of 114 MPs more than the 111 votes required to form a government with a simple majority and becomes Malaysia's ninth Prime Minister. At last, UMNO has reclaimed its premiership after it was ejected from power by voters in the 2018 general election amid graft allegations. He's one lucky guy. He was at the right place at the right time. Under normal political circumstances, he would not be given a chance to be Prime Minister. The only reason why uh, he was uh, elected the prime minister was, if you were to ask me, I'll answer in a very blunt way, he had the least number of enemies. So therefore, he was the compromise candidate because it was quite clear you cannot give this seat to the Zahid or the Najib faction because all of them had outstanding court cases. That means opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim failed in his bid to become Prime Minister yet again. But the question is, will the departure of Mr Muhyiddin bring an end to the leadership crisis in Malaysia? Oh, absolutely not. It's uh, probably the uh, continuation of it, uh, if not the worsening, you see, of the political crisis because there's really been no um, satisfactory resolution as far as the people or the voters were concerned because they were not able to go to the ballot box to kind of return, you see, the legitimate mandate to the government. And so there's a lot of void there. So even if there is a change, uh, which I don't think will be a drastic change anyway because the coalition will still be called the Perikatan National, I would imagine. The only test for this new government is a test of how they're going to handle the COVID crisis. How are they going to bring down the numbers of daily infection? What are their plans and programs to actually, not only to bring it down, but to bring up the economy? Because that has suffered uh, a lot also. The reality is, the political saga in Malaysia may not be over, even with a new Prime Minister at the helm. Mr Ismail Sabri will remain beholden to the UMNO faction, who supported him, including Zahid Hamidi and Najib Razak, dubbed the Court Cluster. He will also be indebted to other component parties within the ruling Parikata National Government, especially Basatu, which has 31 MPs. Should Basatu MPs decide to withdraw its support for AMNO one day, the government may collapse once again. And of course, Mohidin uh, Bersatu is also supporting, right, uh, uh, the new uh, coalition. So he's still there. You could say that he's still a, a, a sort of a kingmaker too, because he can also pull out Bersatu. And then, you know, Amno will be left without the majority. And, and if the new Prime Minister's uh, confidence is tested in, uh, legitimacy is tested in, in Parliament, right, Bersatu can also uh, will uh, the stick and say, look, you know, if you are not going to give us what we want, 
we can also threaten not to provide you with a vote of confidence. Many things. So it's, it's just like just a game, you see now. No? Everyone is just, just having their own uh, cards, you know, played. It's just personal or party interest now. Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaakob is facing a myriad of challenges upon taking office in light of the worsening public health emergency. Will he be able to curb the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic? Can he bring an end to the political instability and intra-party competition and nurse the economy back to health? These are questions which will be answered in the coming weeks and months. Meanwhile, Muida Nyasin's resignation after only 17 months in power has made him Malaysia's shortest serving Prime Minister. Will this mark the end of his political career? Or is there still hope left for him to make a comeback in the ever-revolving door of politics in Malaysia? The truth is, Mr Muhyiddin has all the makings of a successful leader, given his vast experience in politics and in government. But the pandemic and the internal squabbling within the coalition had left him open to attacks and challenges from all quarters, giving him very little room to prove his mettle. And that led to his downfall. He had all the political skills. So you have to remember, Muyadik is a man with vast political skills. People keep forgetting that he has spent many decades in UMNO politics, not only at the federal level, but also at the state level. So I think one of the major mistakes he's made was that he took his eyes off the important things that the people were worried about, which is the state of the economy. A lot of people lost their jobs, lost their income. When he came into power, that was the start of the COVID you know, pandemic. And then when he left, it was the peak you see, of the uh, pandemic. So um, if there's anything that people can remember him by, it is really that he was the prime minister of the pandemic period. All efforts were kind of focused towards trying to resolve you see, the crisis. So it's, it's very difficult, for example, to measure whether he has contributed much, for example, to the economy or to political reforms, uh, or even you know, to kind of uh, easing, say, the ethnic tensions, uh, because uh, there simply was no opportunity uh, for him, you see, to show uh, his leadership uh, capability.